Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zingo Show episode number 90! What's going on man, episode number 90, we're finally out of the 80s, finally! Finally, finally, finally out of the 80s, episode number 9-0, okay? Nuebe zero, okay? Nuebe zero, okay? Here we are, man. Here we are. It's the Agostino Zingo Show episode number 90 with me, your host, Agostino. Welcome back all. Hope you had a wonderful weekend and a wonderful start of the week. As you can see, I am perspirating as... You know what? I think the last few podcasts have been perspirating a lot. Um, I think I've mentioned a few times too. Um, that I'm in pain, that my body feels wet, um, and all that stuff, all that malarkey. But you know, today's been today hasn't been helped by the addition of me running two miles. I did a little two two mile time trial today. It wasn't the quickest time I've done in my um, period of running. I think it was like 17 minutes, about eight minutes fifty per mile. But then I didn't warm up either, so I'm going to give myself a bit of slack. But I hardly, I, I hardly warm down. You know, I don't really try and cool down. So when I when I get back home and I jump into a shower. I end up perspiring even more. I'm sure there's some science behind it. I'm sure there's a reason why you shouldn't be doing it. But hey, here I am. So now I'm wiping my face like a preacher. You know, like the Pentecostal parent preachers in it on, on a pulpit. Like, and I said to him, and uh, what you have to do uh, is put your hand in the air and the Lord Jesus will come back and save you. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm that kind of guy. Because you only ever see black guys, isn't it? Right? Wiping themselves with hand towels, right? You never, have you ever seen a white guy do that? Is it just, just a, an exclusive black guy thing? I think we just use too much cocoa powder or Vaseline. I remember actually telling someone this actually at, at work the other day. I remember there was a period in my life, right, before I discovered or before I could get my own money. This is the thing, right? This this is what happens when you're when you live in an immigrant household, right? You start to realize that when you live in the good thing about living in an immigrant household is that you have the bare necessities given to you, right? Until you get to an age where you start thinking, you know what? I need to use other stuff, right? I need to, I need to, you know what I mean? I need to, I want, I want my own things. And then you get your own job, you start making money and you start buying your own things. So I remember in the house, we had like a, we had like a house, um, a house shower gel that everyone used. That was just basic. You didn't have any sort of scent or anything. You had a house kind of like deodorant or types of deodorant that your mum would buy everyone, one each that they can keep for themselves. You had your house toothpaste. You had your house stuff, right? The house sort of things. And I remember in my house, the house, the kind of go-to moisturizer. Just, look, again, this sounds crazy, but the go-to moisturizer at the time was Vaseline. So we used to all moisturize our skin with Vaseline, right? And as you can tell, um, I'm quite an oily, an oily individual, right? My skin is, um, my skin doesn't lack any moisture, right? Because there's, and it's not even a black thing, because there's some black guys out there who have really dry skin. I don't think it's race specific, right? People just have dry skin. People have um, very oily skin, and my skin is quite oily. So I used to put on top of this bloody oily surface, I used to soak it in Vaseline. And I used to wonder why it's always sweat, which um, affected me a lot in school, but also made me a lot, sh which also made me have uh, tactics to make sure I don't sweat too much, right? Like not moving too much, not running for buses, like little, little tricks I did. But I remember that being the first time where I realized that maybe I have to get my own money and buy my own thing. And I remember that, that was the first time I actually started buying cocoa butter as like a moisturizer but then even that wasn't enough because if you know anything about cocoa butter if you've used it you know the consistency of it is pretty thick so you know any sort of like cream that you we have been using or i've been used to using since i was younger has always led to me fucking sweating and leaking all over the gaff but now i've kind of learned my lesson and i've gone the complete opposite way so now when it's summer and now like today is a good example i don't put any moisturizer on until i leave the house basically until i get to, until i'm about to step out the door to go go to work i don't put anything on i just jump out of the shower and just try and cool down but obviously it's not working today because i'm still sweating my ass off and i'm not sure when it's gonna end but yeah whatever 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 short things you know little things in life sometimes make you stronger Imagine trying to make a, an Instagram post, a motivational Instagram post of the fact that you're sweating, right? Sometimes in life, you got to let go of the liquid in order to get to your future. Sometimes in life, you know, sweating is only one step away from your dreams. You know that kind of shit? Like, what? Get go? Um, yeah, but whatever. What can you do? I hope you guys had a nice weekend. Forget all this sweating stuff. I'm going to keep wiping my face. So if you watch this on YouTube, I apologize if you see me with a hand towel. If you listen to this on audio, you'll just hear weird muffles from the background over there. Like I'm talking, I'm in the other room. But then you hear me come closer to the mic. That means that I've just finished wiping my face. And, you know, we'll just continue going on like that.
But yeah, hope you guys had a great weekend, man. How was it? Did you guys have fun? Um, get out much? Have a? Uh, did you have a walk in the sun like I did, or did you stay indoors and melt away in your duvet? I wonder how many people out there are actually still sleeping in duvets. Because I was um, in my household, I was the first person to actually sleep in to not sleep in a duvet in my household, right? I was the first person to take a stand and say I'm going to put my duvet away, and then the brunette kind of followed suit, but she was holding on for dear life in a duvet. I was like, "What is wrong with you, man? You're absolutely nuts, man!" Oh my god, I'm not gonna stop sweating today, am I? I just need to stop moving, possibly. You know what I mean? I just, just need to stop moving or just sit up straight. Plus, I'm sitting in a plastic chair. It's just an absolute disaster today, man. Bloody hell. Mm. But anyway, yeah. So, oh, fucking hell. So yeah, um, I wonder who else is sleeping in, in a duvet. I don't know where, but who knows? I watched a really good video that kind of described why we're having such a good heat wave this summer, and that was quite interesting. Um, figuring out that you know most of, most of mainland Europe is also going through the same sort of heat wave that we're having at the moment, and I think it's really um, it's I think the wet the worst rainfall has um occurred is it in denmark right denmark i think denmark and sweden have like i've been, I've been extremely wet this whole summer so spare a thought for those guys over there right so if you're complaining that's really hot imagine having this entire summer just be completely wet so um it's been yeah i think overall it's been a really good summer but it's also made me realize that by and large i definitely don't see my future living in london like um i, I think that was part of my rationale when i was debating or thinking about places that i'd like to go to uh, to move out, uh, move to, right? Because the whole idea, the whole plan is to kind of, you know, um, to kind of create a muse or create some sort of side hustle that allows us to live um, in a smaller city in London, pay half the rent, have half the living cost, you know, but also work from home, kind of work off, off a laptop kind of thing. That's the sort of like um, the ultimate dream. Um, it's not as heady as other people's dreams are, you know, but in that it does contain a lot of autonomy, a lot of independence, you know, be your own boss, blah, 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 blah. But part of the rash, part of the kind of thinking behind it was that I remember giving myself this weird kind of like, um, question of, uh, and the question was something along the lines of, or proposition was something along the lines of, um, the only reason why I'm leaving London is because England by and large or London or England for by and large, because <coughs> the plan is to move to a smaller city in England and go somewhere else abroad. But England by and large, we don't really have good summers, right? We have like a summer where it's a couple of days in a row or three days in a row or five days in a row, but it's not a consistent summer. Like you don't get, you like you like uh, we don't have a season where it starts like from May. Okay, from May until September, it's going to be summer. It's usually just, it just starts when it starts and ends when it ends. But this see this obviously this summer has been completely different because we've actually had a real summer, you know. Uh, uh, we had a, a kind of a shower a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days ago, right? We had a bit of rainfall that came on, that was quite nice. Um, I, I remember when it started raining, I was outside actually, and people started cheering, which was quite funny. I <laughs> seen everyone cheering when the, when it started raining. Um, but overall, that was kind of the rationale behind moving and going to another country. Sorry about that. I touched the mic there. And having thought of it even more or having kind of debated the decision even more, I think it was something that I'm definitely going to stick towards because even with the heat, London is still quite unbearable. Um, for the most part, you know, public transport, there is no air conditioning. Uh, for the most part, the outdoor activities are fairly non-existent. Um, for the most part, again, this is a tiny thing that doesn't make any sense because, you know, you could just like stop drinking, it won't affect you. But pubs and bars, man, still serving you warm pints, not chilling the glasses. It's like, come on. Like, I'm honestly like, um, I think that's where entrepreneurs come, entrepreneurism comes in, right? Um, you look at the market, you see what people are doing wrong, or you see a gap and you see something you could fill and then you kind of jump on it. But honestly, like, has no one thought that it might be a good idea to, uh, I don't know, to buy an industrial fridge? Or something along those lines, second hand, right? And put loads of I don't know, not even all your beers, right? Maybe a, a particular a particular craft beer, right? Um, glasses inside that fridge, have them chill. So when people order those drinks, they always get them in a chilled glass, at least, right? Or run a promotion where you're serving chilled drinks in like um, half pints glasses, right? Similar to what they do in Spain. Or for the summer allow people to have like free snacks whilst they're drinking their drinks so they don't get too fucked up because you know sometimes in the heat you end up drinking ciders and you end up getting absolutely smashed before you realize it right 
I'm just, I don't know. It's just something that always really like um, startled me. Like no one has thought it might be a good idea um, to maybe have some glasses in a, in, in a fridge. And you're still getting glasses given to you in plastic cups. You're still getting warm fucking glass mugs. It's like, it's insane. That's, those lack of details aren't really helping as well. And I don't know, just generally in it, like London isn't really the greatest city to be in when it's really, when it's sweltering hot like this. Um, the green spaces aren't as plentiful as they should be. Well, although that being said, we did take a walk this Saturday. Um, actually, let me tell you about my weekend, which was quite interesting. Um, so on Friday, I ended up DJing at, um, at Tappies, which has been quite fun. Um, as always, I'm internally grateful, you know, to be called back somewhere where however small, however low budget, um, however inconsequential it might be to other people. For me, I'm, I'm very, 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 very grateful for the opportunity to play. I remember cause they're having, you know, I'm filling up, um, I'm posting some of the events up on resident advisor or putting them up on Facebook and you just start to remember, you start to look through some of the events that you put up and stuff, whatever. And you, I can, I can remember there being a real barren spell a real a period of like six seven months where i wasn't getting any bookings where i wasn't playing out anywhere and i wasn't really mixing at home too because you get this you get into this weird funk right where you know i kind of believe i'm better than a lot of people out there right I'm, i kind of believe i'm better than a lot of people on the scene who are playing out there because you know they're still playing the same boring sets um no one's playing any new music and um, it's just the same old shit same old faces right so i know i'm better than these people but on paper it looks like i'm not because i'm not playing anywhere right it's like kind of like a black and white thing it's sort of like sports right you can say you're better than lebron james but are you playing in the league nah exactly so it's like you know your arguments don't avoid so sometimes when you're in that kind of funk it can be difficult as well to kind of you know keep practicing at home and upload the mixes because i was doing that quite a lot recently i was doing that quite a lot not recently but a few years ago i was doing that quite a lot especially during my balance balance but to kind of keep my creativity going and to kind of always showcase my skills and it was sort of like and if i'm honest it was kind of like a a little public middle finger do you know what i mean like all right cool you're not gonna book me watch this then do you know what i mean like listen to this look how sick i am of course not many people listen to it because it might have got like 17 plays or something on soundcloud but the whole point of it was for me to exercise my um or to kind of um exercise my skills right to, to showcase what i can do right so during that balance spell you get into a bit of a funk you don't upload mixes you're just you know in your in your feelings for lack of a better phrase um so i'm internally grateful to be given the opportunity to play you know every friday at a bar in westford just where near, just exactly around the corner from where i live i can walk there um it's it's an amazing it's amazing it's amazing enough and, and i think you know and it, it, it needs to be said it goes without saying right playing every week in front of a crowd who are expecting you to be good right really makes you much better than what you think you are like i thought i was good before but i'm much much better than i was um six months ago even a year ago i'm much much better dj 100 percent much better dj now the only problem i have now is that i'm probably a much better pub and bar dj then I'm a nightclub DJ at the moment, right? Because I'm more my, most of my sets I'm playing are between seven and eleven. They're usually quite like slow vibes. I'm not playing a lot of I'm not playing a lot of electronic music. I'm not playing a lot of underground. Stuff. I mean, I, I'm I'm playing kind of like basic stuff. I'm slipping a lot of my own stuff in there as well. I'm kind of you know I'm keeping it fresh and playing a lot of the stuff that I want to play in. I'm I'm doing the whole rule of like you know two for you, one for me, one for me, two for you. You know I'm kind of you know I'm I'm kind of I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I can be. But I'm also realizing that maybe my uh, the other side of me that was very strong, I thought the kind of like, you know, the fact that I could play uh, a really good two hour techno set is sort of waning because I haven't been practicing that and I'm not I'm not uploading mixes onto SoundCloud. So I think that's probably the one learning I've probably taken from this is that as much as it's been amazing, as great as it's been to be playing every week at the same venue and to be uh, honing my craft, I still have to make sure that I'm sharpening the other side of my skill set too. So making sure that I'm uploading mixes um, when it comes to techno and house stuff. Just stuff I don't play outside. I think I might do that. I might just start uploading because I've got already, I've got loads of stuff on there that kind of showcases what I play in bars and stuff. You can kind of check that out as well. I'll put my SoundCloud mix on the description below, but I've got loads of mixes from like, um, dip from the disco to disco nights, nights I used to do at the Bird and Leighton Stone to the other bits and bobs I got on there, like live recordings, you'll see them listed on my SoundCloud. I'll, li I'll list it in the um, link below. But I've got a lot of those already out there. So I need to, I think I might need to just kind of like, you know, um, raise up the kind of techno house sort of like side of things. But again, overall, like I said, I'm eternally grateful, man. Super, super grateful. Um, I did a little bit of an exercise over the weekend, actually, where I sort of written down all the things that I've kind of semi-achieved or semi stuff that I've kind of done since the, since the start of the year. 
And even though I'm not where I want to be in with all the things I've done so far, I am really happy with how much progress I've made. And I think this little uh, period where I've kind of constructed these little micro goals that I want to achieve until the end of August have really kind of allowed me to kind of concentrate and recalibrate my attention to what the kind of to keep my kind of my eye on the prize um for lack of a better phrase so yeah i'm just eternally grateful man like i honestly i couldn't be more happy you know like playing every weekend um i'm reading a lot i'm working out a lot um i'm writing on my blog you know like stuff is just like you know i'm, I'm just feeling a lot I'm, I'm feeling alive for lack of a better term i'm feeling much much more alive than i did probably a few months ago which you know again it all goes back to that focus thing you know focus man you gotta focus you gotta pay attention you know you gotta look him in the eye not the chest look him in the eye in the eye head height head height head height eye contact so yeah um so i spent most of my week i spent i spent a friday playing until 12 um which was interesting i ended up waning the last half an hour or so or last hour but i, I ended up battling it through and holding on then I ended up taking, then after I played at um, Tap East, I then headed off, I then headed off to Mixed Garage and Hackney Wick and saw Dan Beaumont and Hammer play, which was pretty awesome as well. Mixed Garage is, uh, Mixed Garage is, Mixed Garage is a proper underrated venue. I know a lot of people don't really head out to Hackney Week anymore and maybe with the whole Hackney licensing stuff, people have been put off by it. But honestly, that little trifecta of, of bars at the Yard Theatre, Mixed Garage, um, what's it thing called? The Crate. Those three bars in that little car park, all banging. And really, honestly, like I think maybe the friendliest security guards in the world work in that area. Like, super nice, man. You know, obviously their presence is a bit overbearing because they they stand outside, they're patrolling on the inside of the, of the nightclub. That's standard nightclub, but that's standard London nightlife, isn't it? Like, there's a there's a bit of a, a heavy-handed approach when it comes to security. But by and large, man, everyone's really cool, man, especially the guys at um, Mixed Garage, man. They're really, really nice dudes. Um, bar staff are really cool, too, very quick. Just in general, just a very well, well, well-run pub um, or nightclub, whatever you maybe call it. And um, Dan Beaumont... Um, the guy that used to be behind the dance tunnel and I f I'm, I'm assuming Voodoo Raids as well, probably. Um, I'm assuming he's part of that too. Uh, he played and a guy called Hammer too, who's uh, if you might be familiar with Andy Blake and those guys, they do a lot of nights out in North London too. Still DJing at Mixed Garage. So I saw them play until about half two, then headed home, had a sleep. Um, was a bit hungover, I've got to be honest, but more tired and hangover, you know, because I was working on a Friday too. So I had to come back home, rush them at five, um, quickly have a shower, pack all my shit and then head out to go dj from like 7 to 11 or 7 to 12 and then kind of stayed out till 3 so i wasn't really smashed because i didn't really have that much to drink i probably had about three pints uh spread out across those spread out between 7 to 12 which is you know which is not that much for me usually because i usually drink a lot more but i only had three pints and then i probably had one drink when i went to mixed garage and then came back home so i wasn't hangover just more so tired but then I um, made a promise that I'd go out on a Saturday and have a walk. And I felt quite, I felt all right, to be honest. After I had a really cold shower, I felt all right. So we headed out, went to, went to the Victoria Park, actually, um, which was really nice, actually. A lot nicer than I thought it would be. Um, we picked out a little spot, did a bit, bit did have, had a little liquid picnic. So I bought loads of liquid and a bag of ice and just had, sat around just chatting shit. There was a hockey match going on in the park somewhere. But, you know, who gives a shit about women's hockey? Sorry, but, you know, no one cares. So we just hung out there for a little bit. Um, and that was really nice too, actually. Um, that whole Victoria Park, um, uh, sorry, Olympic Park sort of area, Stratford Park is really nice, actually. Loads of families out, loads of nice greenery, nice benches and shit. It's a bit, it's a bit out of the way for us at the moment. You know, 15 minute walk to get there kind of thing. It's not like a local park where you can just walk up the road and kind of found it. But again, it's not super far. It's sort of like behind Westfield um, Shopping Centre. So it's not that bad or you, more so near the canal. Um, if you're near Hacking Wick, you know like where the canal is, there's a few kind of parky areas you can kind of hang out around there. So yeah, that was fairly decent and quite a fun time. And then spent most of Sunday just lying inside and not doing anything else really. So pretty chill weekend. And I think I'm going to, especially if I'm DJing every weekend or if I'm DJing on a Friday, I think I'm going to keep that um, template going. Um, not make them uh, nights to go out all crazy and that. And that maybe that might speak to my maturity levels, right? It might speak to a kind of changing of the guard or changing of mentality. Because I remember, you know, a year ago, you know, the fact that I was DJing gave me an excuse to just go out and go mental. But now it's turning into a bit of a job, uh, turning into a bit of a side job. 
a side hustle, let's say. Um, I want to put my best foot forward, so I want to do a good job as well. I want to I want to play well. I want to play good music. So um, in order to do that, you can't be too fucked up. Do you know what I mean? I kind of, it's nice to have a bit of a liquid courage, a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of liquid lubricant, you know, have a little, have a couple of pints to kind of get you going. But after that, I sort of like level out and just kind of just stick with the the tap water with loads of ice in it and just kind of go in that direction. Usually, anyway, that's what I try and do by and large. But yeah, it's been it's been a fairly packed weekend, man. I'm not going to lie. Um, I've kind of been feeling a little bit over... What's that thing called? I've kind of been feeling like I'm getting stretched a bit thin, if I'm being completely honest, you know? Working full-time, doing this all the time, every weekend, DJing and shit. It's been a bit difficult. But I think this is this is part and parcel of what it is you know to kind of you know achieve your dreams is to kind of go for something that you want you you kind of reach this weird stage where you start to realize wow i've come quite far but there's so much more i have to do do you know what i mean like i've got so far to go and it's just going to require more of this kind of work and the kind of key phrase i'm kind of keeping in my mind is just consistency i've just got always got to show up right it doesn't matter if i have a bad set it doesn't matter um if people don't like what i play if i just I don't know, I don't um, clock with the crowd or, I don't know, something, I just have an off day, I've just got to consistently show up. It's just reps and sets. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And over time, I eventually will get to where I need to get to. You know what I mean? Everything will happen how it needs to happen, but um, in order for it to happen, you just have to keep consistently showing up. And that means consistently showing up when I'm training five days a week um, or six days a week, when I'm working five, full time, when I have other commitments outside of work, um, when I'm doing all these other projects outside of DJing, it's it's kind of like a it it kind of weighs on you on your in your head overall, and then you kind of start to understand why freelancers like to be freelance, right? Or people who like to work part time, right? Like to have the kind of like the um, the four days off on the week or work three days and work four. Day. You know what I mean that kind of um, timetable because what that does is that it affords you the mental space in order to kind of get your shit together. Because imagine, right? If I'm DJing over the weekend. During the week when I'm coming back from work, I have to prepare my stuff. Like during the week, I'm preparing songs to play. I'm thinking about things I want to play. I'm putting them down in the little notes. I'm writing down things in order of the way I want to play. I'm reading and playlists and shit. Um, I'm thinking about blog posts I want to I want to write. I'm reading all the time. Like there's little things that are playing in your head. But when you're working, when you have when you when you, when you got four days off, you can kind of afford to do those things, right? But because I only have two. I'm sort of trying to squeeze as much time. I'm trying to squeeze as much as I can at the time I have available. Hence why I do a podcast early in the morning before I head off to work. Do you know what I mean? Because this is the only time I can, um, f- I can physically do it. Because I have the time, I have the space. I've got a free house at the moment. No one's around. I can kind of do what I want. Speak as loud as I want. And then I can upload. And then, and then. So yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting place to be, you know? It's an interesting place to be. You kind of... It's what you always wanted and then you realise, wow, there's a lot more work that's needed to kind of even get even even an inch close to where I want to get to. It requires even more work. So if I thought I was working hard before, God damn, I ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet, motherfucker. You got to work even harder. So here it comes. I got to work even harder to get nowhere fast. And then sometime soon, maybe in six years, five, four, three, two, one, I'll be where I need to get to. But yeah, that'll be an interesting place to be, innit? Um, overall. But yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. Like I said, I'm fucking enjoying it. I'm just I'm just grateful. You know, you're just grateful that you play somewhere and the people like what you play and they invite you back. That's always a very good feeling. You always feel like, oh wow, like people like me. But then there's one thing being liked by the bar staff, right? Because I've had that before. The bar staff like you, but then the punters don't. Or it's the other way around. The punters like you, but the bar staff don't. So you have to still win enough. You have to still win somebody else over. So then you go back again and you win them over, and it's like, wow, man, you feel good, right? So um, I'm happy with that, and hopefully, may it long continue. May it long continue. May it long continue. And talking about DJing and talking about going out, as you might have guessed, I am DJing again this Friday, the 10th of August, at Tapis. You shall, if you're watching this on YouTube, you should see a flyer pop up on your screen right now. I'm DJing this Friday at Tap East. Uh, for a night called Tapped. Tap piece for a night called Tapped from 5 p.m. to 11, but I'll be on from 7. But come down there anyway. After work drinks, you know, playing loads of ABBA, loads of Rod Stewart, loads of David Bowie, Jackson 5. Nice disco, funky vibes. I bet Stevie Wonder might drop in there too. This Friday at Tap East for a night called Tapped. Tap piece, Tapped. 
me alongside Afro Musa, my good friend Natalia, will be playing back to back. So yeah, come down on Friday and check it out. It's, it's always a really good time. I enjoy myself. I think everyone else does too. Hence why they keep inviting me back, which is a good feeling. But yeah, um, what else has been going on? You know what I've been getting pissed off about, actually? Random thought. You know those people on the train who get on and go through the entire fucking carriage, g-dum, 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 through the fucking door so they can get so they can sit in the exact perfect carriage that they want to sit in so they can get out earlier. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you, right? Like, just sit. You're a grown-up, right? You've made, like, some t- when, it, when the train's on the platform, you're more than welcome to, because I do it myself. When the train's on the platform, you're more than welcome to walk down the platform and kind of, like, pick your um, carriage of choice, right? It's not, you know, even though you probably think it, it's not fucking first-class flights, right? But pick your carriage of choice, right? Go to the front, go to the middle, go to the back, wherever you, whatever's best for your exit uh, of the station that you're getting off at. But if the train's already moving in transit, mate, you're a grown adult, like, cut your losses and sit down, right? Because you're going to walk anyway when you get out of the train. It doesn't matter, you're going to walk. This idea of like saving time, right? Do you know what I mean? Of like, oh no, I have to squeeze as much time as I can out of things. And these are the same motherfuckers who waste time on their fucking phone all the time. Do you know what I mean? Who just waste time sitting around with this little gadget in their hand. And yet you want to burst through doors in the middle. And most of these people that burst through doors in between carriages don't close them either. Who, who brought these people up? What household were you brought up in where you just open the door and not close it behind you? Bruv. Back in my back in my house, if I did that, you'd again you'd have got a fucking iron thrown at the back of your head. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, you can't do that shit. If you're gonna open the door, close it, brother. Close the fucking thing. And they never do. It's always like that same, you know, that same jumped up personality. You know, that kind of oh no, I gotta I gotta get up on time. It's bloody losers, man. Like that, those people that that go to stations on those bloody motorized scooters to save time. Do you know what I mean? Like, fuck off, man. How eager are you to get to work, really? And it's not even about you know what it is. It's not even eager about getting to work. They wanna, they wanna, they wanna have a lie in so much, right? They wanna lie in as as long as possible that they're willing. They're willing to denigrate themselves as humans, right? They're willing to denigrate themselves as humans and ride a fucking motorized scooter. That's when you know. That's when you know you've kind of hit rock bottom. And or not even a motorized scooter. The ones you got to push along with, like maybe like a fucking adult baby. Like count me the fuck out. And supposedly um, Uber have got, um, Uber have a, 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 what do you call it? A ride sharing or whatever. Those sharing things like a, like a Boris bike version of the scooters, haven't they? Have you seen those? They're all, they're all around LA, motorized scooters. They're kind of, of course, they're launching them in kind of key cities. So I'm, I'm guessing they're going to launch them in LA, launch them in NY, maybe Chicago, and then kind of come to mainland Europe. But fuck off, man. Like we're going to, already these um, orange bikes that I've been riding a few times that are just, you know, they're great, don't get me wrong, they're a lot lighter than the Boris bikes, but they're still a, a complete shit to ride over anything over a mile. Even even under a mile, they're still fucking hard to ride. They're just a fucking horror show of a bike. But imagine all the fucking d- dumb nuts, numb nuts that are going to be riding around in those motorized scooters. There's going to be so many accidents, right? Because I'd imagine those scooters are a lot harder to ride than people make out to be, right? Like, especially for the general public. Because the person that the kind of person that rides a motorized scooter, you, you can kind of see they kind of take it seriously, right? They have those kind of wrist guards, so when they fall, they don't twist their wrists. They have knee pads and shit. You know, they they wear those fucking um, what do you call it? Um, gonna call the police, Oakleys, right? They got that kind of look, innit? it? Um, so I'm not sure the regular kind of folk on road are gonna be able to handle that power of that thing. Because how fast do they go? Like 20 miles an hour. 30, 40 miles an hour, that's pretty quick, man, for, you know, a mum to just jump on it. Like, say, oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna pop over to fucking Harrods, you know? It's like, good luck, babes. And are they, are they even road legal anyway? It's just, yeah, I don't know, man. Let's see. But, yeah, they annoy me to fuck off, man. Like, you can just fuck right off with your opening of the doors in the middle. It's just the rage I feel, man, honestly. And it never, it's honestly... If you've ever noticed someone that does that whole walking through the entire carriage of a train, you realise they never close the door. They've always got this fun akin, weird kind of strut uh, about them. It's like, the, it's like the kind of person that walks, you know, on the overground, people that walk up and down the fucking whole thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's a fucking catwalk. They have that sort of like idea too. It's like, relax, man. Sit the fuck down. No one cares about your outfit. Do you know what I mean? Congrats. You got some boots on. Sit down, man. Be an adult. Relax. Take a, take a, take, take a breather. Yeah. <sighs> these these are little things that annoy me in life but hey you know what let's take a breather ourselves and onto some topics of the day 
Then I ran down, then I fought up big into the sting. Body boop, ba 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 ba. Let's see here. Um, what have we got here? Oh, you see this video, right? Um, woman slaps immigration officer because she overstayed her visa, right? So, strange video I saw pop up on the old, you know, public freakout subreddit that if you're not subscribed to, you should be subscribed to because it's fucking amazing, right? Let me try and get, let me try and get this up on the screen here so you guys can see. Um, hopefully it shows up on here, right? Show. There we go. Put it up. Boom. Right? Look at this lady, right? So this lady, I'm assuming, the backstory is that she overstayed her visa. And um, I think, right? Like, so you getting a, are you getting punished for it? What happens when you overstay your visa? Let me read the actual video description. Did it say anything on here? Oh, it's all in, it's all in their language. Shit. Jadi kashu nai itu antan India nini ini imangai overstay. Oh, overstay? Look, weird how they got, like, words in English, isn't it? Overstay, right? Jada kashu nai atu... Okay, is that racist if I say stuff like that or not? Probably not, isn't it? Can I be racist and be black? Yeah, of course you can, you idiot. But anyway, this lady, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just one of those kind of videos that interests me because you know when you're wrong, and you get and you get caught up for it, but you're so wrong you get angry at the person that's pointing out you're wrong and you get pissed off. This is a good example of it, right? She's fucking pissed off because she overstayed her welcome and her visas ran out or some shit, right? And then here's here here's how it goes off. Girls and they argue. What is well, funny, isn't it? She's moving closer. what right i know look sometimes you can get pissed off at people right <laughs> and they're gonna annoy you but when in the history of the world right has 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 it ever worked out when you slap somebody all right you're not getting your way you feel like you've been um no one's listening to you the manager's kind of like um treating you with a bit of discontent with a bit of content uh got a bit of contempt you feel like your voice isn't being heard you feel like people are not taking your complaint seriously and then you think you know what so I can convince them that I mean business, I'm going to slap these motherfucking fools. It never works out well. It honestly never works out well. And and it's funny because I'm he, watching this video reminds me of this one time where I missed my flight to Barcelona because um, this is when I wanted to go do the half marathon again. I think it might have been about a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. I went back to Barcelona. Um, if you don't, if you're not aware, I went to Barcelona, I think originally... For the first time in 2013, I think, for my first half marathon. That was when I first got into fitness and I first kind of lost a whole bunch of weight. Um, I was extremely fat for a long, long time. Uh, I'd say maybe from six, end of sixth form until maybe, let's say, quote unquote, the end of uni, I was super fat. So I kind of like got a bit pissed off one time. It's kind of a good, interesting story, actually. I kind of got pissed off. You know, when you, you know, people say, oh, yeah, why don't fat people just lose weight, right? Um, you kind of have to have your own epiphany. You kind of have to have your own little realization and kind of realize, okay, cool, I need to lose a weight. No one, no amount of public shame, no amount of weird eyes or weird looks at you when you get on a train or when you sit down in a carriage and you kind of kind of squeeze in between two skinny people and you feel really fat. No amount of fucking uh, little jabs when you're eating something um, with your mates is gonna work, right? You got you've got to realize it for yourself. Any fatty out there that's listening will know. Like you have to make a decision yourself. If you don't care, you don't care, right? So one time I think I was gonna go. But I needed to. I needed to change. Oh, my jeans ripped. Right. This was back in the day when I used to like, wear these hundreds jeans. Right. I had these um hundreds of denim jeans that Bobby Hundreds actually gave me personally, which is another interesting story for another day. But Bobby Hundreds gave me these jeans when they first started making selfish denim. Right. And I was wearing them till death. Right. I fucking battered the fuck out of these pairs of jeans. And then I remember um, they ripped. Right. And these are the jeans that I kind of wore and they were like my kind of fat fat girl jeans right so they kind of stayed with me for a long time they kind of uh, molded to my waist size so I was a I, I didn't really have an, an idea of what actual waist I was plus during that time I was gaining a lot of weight and the jeans were expanding around that weight so I remember going to Uniqlo and trying to buy some jeans and I was getting I was actually sweating because I couldn't find anything right I was looking on the whole shop I couldn't find anything I was my size waist like 36 37 38 nothing was fitting 
And I remember going to a woman and asking her, ah, oh, when the cell distance, right? Asking her, oh, can I get this in the bigger size? And she was like, oh, like something like, you know, something along the lines of like, oh, darling, I'm sorry, but um, the style of the jeans is like, this is, this is the biggest they come. And if they don't fit, they're never going to fit. Like, you know, like, it was it was in a very motherly way, a very nice way, but also in a very like, you know, motherly, like kind of like, dude, you're fat. You're never going to fit into his jeans. And it was like, such a crushing blow to kind of like realize that and then i remember picturing myself a couple of weeks later in a change room with like six pairs of jeans all different sizes trying to fit into them and none of them fitting none of them fitting and i was like you know what fuck this i need to start working out so i just started running every day and eventually the whole the weight came off and i just started getting into running and like you know running ever since so then one time i decided to go to barcelona I had a great time my first visit to barcelona you know had an amazing trip and then i went i tried to go again a couple of years later and uh, I did the thing that not a lot that people should never do, and I tried to leave the house the latest I could. I don't know what I was doing. I might must have been on the internet wanking over some shit, and I ended up missing because um, where I live in Stratford, there's a national co- there's like a, a, a stagecoach bus that takes you from Stratford all the way to Stansted Airport, which is one of our main airports in London, that goes out to one of some most of the mainland Europe uh, destinations. But it's a sort of bus that ru- it's a sort of coach that runs. Uh, between a certain time it's every 15 minutes no between a certain time it's every 15 and after a certain time it's only every 20 to 30 minutes so sometimes that 20-30 minutes that delay plus the journey time is a lot of time you're missing out on so if you miss that bus you've not only missed the wait time you've also missed the journey time because you know to get to stand said and also to get through immigration all that shit malarkey right so i remember one time i missed the bus by seconds right i saw it go past me and i was like oh my fucking god but i still thought i could make it then i got on the next bus and obviously i got there super late no and the next bus came late actually this is when they used to have this i've got the name of the bus company it wasn't even stagecoach it's another bus company because stagecoach is like 10 pound and this other stagecoach this other coach company it stops at like it stops i think at one state or somewhere like that in between stansted but it's like a fiver. So everyone used to go in that one because, you know, it's a holiday. You're, you're going on holiday to mainland Europe. You want to, every penny counts, right? Because that extra fiver is another five euros to your kind of spending budget when you're going out and shit. So I remember uh, um, that bus came late. So it, it didn't, so not only did I miss that bus half, did, not only did I have to wait half an hour, it also came a little bit late. So it came like 45 minutes later and I just ate up all my time. And by the time I arrived at the, at the station, at the airport, I missed my airplane and oh sorry the gate was closed and i was like so fucking gutted but i wasn't i wasn't that gutted but i was like you know just pissed off and i remember kind of walking back from the from the from the gate and a cu- another couple too had missed their had missed the same gate but the girl was fucking crying and cursing out the boyfriend i think i think there must have been a couple oh my god i can't believe it i told you i told you and i was thinking is there any worse scenario right than going on a holiday with your other half, right? Because not usually, I don't know about you guys, but usually in a relationship, I'm usually the unorganized one, right? I'm usually the one that's like, you know, I fly by the seat of my pants, everything's a feeling and an emotion. You know, the other half is more so a bit more calculated, a bit more like, babe, we can't afford this, blah, 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 blah. But you know, at me, I just I just go with the flow, which isn't really a good idea sometimes. So I was just thinking, is there any, is there a worse situation to be in than to go on holiday, right? With your other half, right? For them to consistently tell you the week leading up to it that you have to leave at this time, make sure you get up at this time. Are you sure we're gonna have enough time to get to the station? And you assuring her, he he or she, that don't worry, baby, we'll be all right, man. It'll be all right. We'll be cool. We'll be blessed. We'll be having plenty of time to get there. And then you don't you don't get there on time, right? You get there late. The gates closes. Like oh, that feeling is gonna be fucking horrible. She will not let you live it down, man. And that girl was fucking wailing, like crying hysterically. Now, I'm pretty sure she was crying hysterically because at the time, I think there was no next... I, yeah, I think it was a, it was like a 1 p.m. flight. So, usually, I think Stan said do like a, a 6 a.m., 9, and a 1, depending on the flight. Or sometimes they do uh, really like a 6, 7, a 1, and a 7. But they usually don't... There's, there's nothing usually sometimes after 1, depending on the day you leave. Especially if it's on a Saturday, there might not be another flight until the next day. So, maybe they were crying because there wasn't another flight they could get on immediately or maybe they didn't have they couldn't afford the other flight i don't know but she was wailing and i remember i was pissed off too but i was just like silently pissed off you know like a man you know i, I internalized my pissed off and was just like <sighs> walking back out kind of walking out of a state out of an airport 
And as well, there's nothing worse than walking out of an airport that you just walked all the way through, right? Like having to walk back out because you're on your own. Because usually when you're walking out of an airport, you're usually coming out um, with like a group of people who've kind of all kind of you know, arrived at the st- airport at the same time. But when you're walking back out and you're on your own, people can clearly see that you missed your flight. So that's, that's a bit of a bummer. Um, but I remember just being so pissed off and then when I got outside and I saw the, the, the person from the coaching company, just a random person that's in charge of making sure everyone's in the right line and checking your tickets, just like going off on him, right? And I remember him just looking, I remember his look, when he was looking at me, just like, you know, I'm going off him like, you guys, man, you, you guys made me come here late. I meant to get that coach and if it would have came on time, I would have been just on time. Which, you know, it still wasn't on time really for an airport because they always tell you to come at least three hours ahead of time to account for any delays. But I was like, I thought if that bus would have come on time, I would have been just on time. But it came 15 minutes late. And that 15 minutes what cost me to get to the gate. Just going off on him. And I remember him just looking at me and just giving me that kind of look of like, dude, the, what 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 can I do for you here? I'm just I'm just here standing in a free fucking I've got a free jacket on, one of those stagecoach jackets, right? I'm wearing some regular generic black trousers and some, and some boots. Do you know what I mean? Just leave me alone, man. What what, what can I do really? Do you think I want to be spending my Saturday afternoon here having you shouting at me, spitting and raving with your toothpaste breath at me because you missed your 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 plane ride to Barcelona? Woohoo! A trip you've been planning for months and you got there late. It's only your own fault. Do you know what I mean? So that's why I, that's why I now have no sympathy. That guy's look kind of made me feel like a, an idiot. That's why I don't have any sympathy for those people that number one rush through the carriages to get through to their carriage of choice and number two the kind of person that kind of was like excuse me excuse me my uh I need to get to my gate you know when they're kind of rushing through the thing like no just get here on time man like and they always stress everyone else out in the, in the queue you're making everyone else nervous like everyone else has to worry about their time no you're perfectly fine don't worry you got here you got here on time which is why now i usually try and get to, i usually just obey the law and and get to the airport within a three or two hour window just so i can chill out as well, and just chill there and watch a movie. I don't know, listen to a podcast, read, or just sleep. I never got the idea of just leaving. Again, maybe I've only done it, I've only left like, I've only kind of got left with like an hour to give, or an hour and a half when I've been at work, right? When it's been like a work thing, when like, you know, sometimes you've, you've booked a holiday and you want to squeeze as much as you can out of it, so you kind of leave after work, right? And then, so then you have the, you kind of have a bit of the week, a bit of the evening when you land and you have the whole day in the morning. I've kind of done that before where you kind of have to just rush out from work straight away. But apart from that, if I'm leaving on like a day that I'm off, like just get there early, man. Stop being a fucking baby. But yeah, that woman slapping the guy at the immigration office or wherever it may be, is fucking ridiculous. Like honestly, that never works. Um, Just take it from me, right? Shout and people that never works. If you, again, if you're in the position, again, it's human nature, isn't it? When you're wrong and you fuck up, there's something inside of us just like, you know what, fuck you. And you just want to burn the fucking house down. But again, you fucked up. Take your hands off the guy. And imagine if that was a dude slapping a woman or shaking her. If that happened in the immigration office, like, whoo, whoo, whoo. The fucking picket, the pickets will be out, mate. All the signs will be out there in force. Um, what else do I have on the on the list? I kind of want to quickly ramble through. Uh, da, 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 da. Ozil and, and race in Germany, which is an interesting thing as well. I think I think a lot of people have spoken about this already. Might you speak about it? It's just on just purely kind of touch on it a little bit. Um, this guy kind of speaking about his experience of you know racism in Germany, which is interesting. Because obviously my experience of Germany is kind of limited to like Frankfurt and Berlin, which are, you know, two metropolitan cities. Berlin being like the cultural city, cultural hub of Germany and Frankfurt being the economic hub of Germany. So by their, by, by, by default, they're both places that would be quite inviting to people from other countries because, you know, money is graceless and so is culture, right? Um, it's wel- it's welcoming of anyone from any place any background so you won't necessarily feel you won't necessarily be able to gauge what the racial climate is of a country by going to the financial capital or by, by going to the cultural capital but i thought this guy's take on it was pretty interesting and this is off the back of the whole Mesut uzo uh Erdogan kind of picture stuff um and i'll read a little bit of the excerpt here um and he started this hashtag on twitter called me too which is you know two as in a number two it's like go fuck yourself um but hey everyone has to do their thing right everyone's got to get their kind of like or out there on social media 
But anyway, the, the article reads on BBC, an activist who triggered a huge debate about everyday racism in Germany with the Twitter hashtag MeToo says this, the discussion was long overdue. Ali Khan, a German anti-racism activist born in Turkey, spoke on national TV on Monday. Fans of tweets have exposed the scale of racism in Germany. He launched a MeToo campaign on the 25th of July because of Mesut Ozil Fura. The Turkish-born footballer said racism and, dis and disrespect have pushed him to stop playing for the national squad. Before the World Cup, a controversy blew over... Uh, blew up over his decision to pose for a photo with Turkish President um, Erdogan, um, who was visiting London while campaigning for re-election. Also, another German-born footballer of Turkish or origin, um, Ilkay Gundogan, Gundogan uh, drew strong criticism for what they widely seen as political endorsement of Mr. Erdogan. Now, the whole Mesut Uzo thing is a bit, it's all been taught, it's, it's been talked about um, ad nauseum by everyone elsewhere. But the only point I'd have about this is that this kind of annoying me. I think Mesut Uzo's disposition, the way he's kind of built as a person, you can kind of hear it in his kind of tone. He's a bit of a whiner anyway. Is that um, he, he clearly, you know, he clearly stated in his statement that he feels very, he feels a little bit torn, right, by his identity, right? He's German. Uh, but at the same time, he's, he's extremely Turkish, right? His family, his mum always reminds him of his Turkish roots. And his mum has always told him to kind of respect the the office, right? Whoever's in charge, you respect the office, that kind of idea. But Erdogan being such a divisive figure within Europe and within Turkey overall, um, it's a bit... The only problem I have with the whole Mesut Ozil thing, it seemed very naive of the, of the re reception that he was going to get from taking that picture. He seemed very unaware of it. And that's the worrying part of it. It's like, if you're going to stand with somebody who splits opinion, who people think is a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a criminal, right? A bit of a crook, um, who's fixing elections, who's turning his own people against each, against each other, who's uh, plotting a uh, fake civil war, right? If you're going to stand up with these people, you have to also understand that you're going to get some backlash, right? It's sort of similar to those guys on tour, those kind of right-wing um, conservative activists like um, Candice Owen and um, Charlie Kirk and Kevin McGinnis, all those kind of guys on Twitter, they're flamethrowers, but I like them because they know what they're doing, right? The, right. Um, and Coulter, they're very aware of they're winding people up to get to cause a reaction, but they don't get surprised or get put out of place or start making statements and people start offending them or start attacking them back. And the, whole, the only problem I have with Mesut Uzo thing is that he's crying about the criticism he's getting and the racist abuse he's getting from some Germans because of how he's aligned himself with Erdogan. But what did you expect, Giza? Like, what did you honestly expect? This is the, this is the thing that kind of annoys me. And I guess maybe it's his disposition, how he is as a person. He does come across a bit whiny um, when he gets criticized about his performances. He does, he does, he does get a bit butt hurt about shit, but. That's the thing that really just weirds me out a bit. Like, dude, you're standing with Erdogan. Like, it's obvious, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, he he had his security guard beat up uh, political um, protesters outside the embassy when they came visit. You remember that video where his security uh, detail were beating up some of the protesters outside the building? Or he signaled for them to go over and kind of smash them to pieces? Like, this is not a good dude. Do you know what I mean? Like, so you should have been aware of this. But anyway... The article continues. The Turkish leader is accused of human rights abuses over the purge of the state of institutions um, involving mass arrests and harassments of critics. The criticism and hate mail targeted to players intensified after the World Cup when Germany were knocked out of the group matches. Ali Khan said Ozil would have drawn much less criticism had he scored a couple goals, which is not true. Uh, the Me Too campaign attracted over 600,000 tweets since Khan launched it. The hashtag echoes the Me Too social media campaign that mobilized fans of women globally. Um, Ali Khan said, Me Too symbolized the feeling of two cultures, German and Turkish, which do not contradict each other. He repeated a phrase used by Ozil, I have two hearts, one German, one Turkish. Ali Khan's parents moved to Germany when he was a toddler to escape discrimination in Turkey um, as they belong to the Kurdish. That's weird, isn't it, right? So you leave Turkey to escape discrimination because you, you belong to a, a particular clan, right? A, uh, a Kurdish Alibi minority. About 3 million people in Turkish origin live in Germany today. He says confronting everyday racism is essential as Germany faces a major integration integration challenge. More than 2 million... More than a million non-European migrants arrived in Germany in 2015, 2016. Many of them Syrian, Iraqi and Afghan refugees. Far-right alternative... Far-right alternative for Germany, AFD, 
Now the main opposition party with 92 parliamentary seats accuses the government of encouraging an Islamization of the society. In a tweet in German, Ali Khan thanked the many contributors for their accounts of racism in Germany. The public debate has started. Thank you. He also said the flood of courageous tweets about racism now meant nobody could say. After this, we know nothing about it. The phrase has a strong re 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 resonance in Germany because after World War II, many ordinary German claims they knew nothing about Nazi atrocities in their concentration camps. Ali Khan told German broadcaster ZDF in German that he had suffered from racism when looking for a flat to rent and when he was refused entry to a nightclub though his friends were let in he said some club deliberately restricts the numbers of southern looking people they let in a tweet from David Bam of late similar account in the Cologne club in a line to a Cologne in Cologne with my football team 15 of us were let in last guy is black bouncer stops him and tells him club is full we all left black kid is born in rural Bavarian is German is better than mine still happens all the time hashtag me too now of course you can't take any dental evidence as you know as um as evidence of widespread racism but there must be a weird friction overall right because when you go especially when you go to Berlin like you forget how Turkish it is like it's just there's a lot of Turkish heads in Berlin and you can kind of, you know, especially considering that they, you know, you can kind of understand where that resentment will kind of build up, especially for, for people that are a bit um simple minded that can, you know, that can only see one plus one equals two. Right. They'll, you know, they, they see that their economic situation isn't where it should be. They see all these Turkish people around them opening up kebab shops and um, off licenses and spetties and shit and other places like you know supermarkets and they start to think oh why don't they, but there's no germans working there right why, where are all the germans give germans jobs right um which is interesting but that two identities thing was strange you know because we don't really have it here in england right um there i remember there was a thing in school when it, it changed this world cup um because obviously the, the team were probably the team played better and southgate all did really well at integrating the squad um, together, it, was, it seemed a little bit more wholesome. Everyone seemed to kind of get along with each other, and maybe the generation as well has kind of shifted. It don't really, maybe this generation doesn't have that much of a. Um, it's not as taboo as it was. It was back in the day to support England, but I remember back in the day in school, when a non-white kid used to wear an England top, they used to be called an Uncle Tom, basically wearing a white kid. Do you know what I mean? It was like, what are you doing? Like, don't, don't you know what that stands for? And that was that maybe because that was during the time when uh, the whole EDL and BMP were at its peak or at its infancy, right? And they sort of like co-opted co the uh, great St. George flag as like to represent, you know, England uh, as a kind of like a pulling away from the Great British flag, right? Which kind of represented the, the colonial power and the kind of like um, Labour Party um, immigrants all are all invited and, you know, um, that sort of thing. So they kind of reclaimed the St. George's flag so that anyone that was black or brown or whatever or Asian... When you put on an England shirt, people look to you in a bit of a side eye. Do you know what I mean? It was a bit strange. They didn't really get it. But this summer's probably been the only summer that I've probably seen a lot. I've seen more people that aren't white wearing an England top than any other summer in my whole entire life living in England, honestly. So the whole identity thing about being, feeling like your heart is also, your heart can be, you know, British and whatever country you're from or German and Turkish. I can't really relate to in that sense, but I kind of get the kind of where the conflict can come into it by some way, shape or form, especially if you've left Turkey uh, during an age where you kind of remember the turmoil that you left it in, right? Especially if you, you know what I mean? You remember leaving Turkey with, I don't know, with mortar bombs flying off down, with setting off down the road where you live or hearing fighter jets flying over your house and shit. You have that visceral memory in your head, right? Of seeing, of hearing, of neighbours dying, right? Of being shot or being in prison and shit. You know these things happen. And then moving to, over to Germany, and kind of being given an education, you know, being allowed to speak a, a language that allows you to kind of move up the socioeconomic ladder. I can kind of see we can kind of get torn. I mean, German kind of gave you a chance for your family to do better, to kind of raise them out of poverty, but you also recognize your roots and you know where you come from, right? You know that you are not really German. You know, you're, you're Turkish. You're kind of this weird hybrid, um, which is, again, going to be interesting. With the immigration, um, with the kind of the rise of the far right, you know, sort of like um, wanting to limit the amount of immigration happening and with immigration still ha happening at, you know, at fucking obscene rates with the debate not being as rational as it should be. Right. Um, there is no such thing as a middle ground in the immigration debate. It's, it's always like open borders or borders all around. It's going to be interesting to see where that whole identity kind of thing goes on from now on going forward. But I don't agree with the whole mess of Ozil thing. If you just score a couple of goals, everything has been okay. I think, you know, people are always looking for reasons to kind of shit on Mesut Ozil because, you know, he's, he, he, 
he's kind of he's just one of those kind of players that kind of divides opinion unfortunately and you know and as always with some people who jump into political conversations um he he didn't he didn't for some reason he finds it weird that people are you know freaked out about the things that he's doing right with Erdogan like that's the kind of thing that just always bugs me out like what do you expect the reaction to be dude really like honestly but anyway I saw that and I thought that was interesting what else is on the list um oh the fire festival founder is going to jail that was an obvious thing that we knew was gonna happen right um the guy I was called, I mean, you're aware of this right that whole social media festival that was happening a few months a year ago a few years ago right so this guy basically goes out and hires or kind of indoor gets all these big celebrity influencers to kind of back this um it, it looked like coachella on an island right it kind of looked like that kind of that kind of vibe right um sort of like a millennial version of burning man very glitzy very glamorous um loads of tiki tiki tents and shit but unfortunately, it didn't go well and it kind of flopped. Um, poor organization, people posting pictures of the food that they were getting, a couple, couple slices of bread and some salad and a fucking styrofoam uh, case. So it went really shit. And obviously, Ja Rule was involved in it, which was a weird sort of like um, endorsement. He kind of put some money up for that festival too. And it seems like everything is crashing around this guy. And um, the article I saw on Mixmag the other day um, kind of highlighted where he's at at the moment. It's painful to read, actually, to be honest. But hey, sometimes you got when you take chances with these sort of things, you can kind of get burnt. Um, the article reads the following. On Tuesday, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, settled its claims against the founder of the disastrous fire festival, Billy McFarland, who was accused of defrauding more than 100 investors out of 27.4 million. Shit, so his investors are, f are suing him. That's nuts. Not even the attendees yet. Is that part, or is that suit part, or does that suit include the people that attended? Well, McFarlane has admitted to the SEC charge against him. The SEC stated that McFarlane induced investors to entrust him with tens of millions of dollars by fraudulently inflating key operational financial metrics and successes of his companies. The funds he managed to raise for his once in a lifetime music festival, Bankrupt McFarlane's lavish lifestyle, penthouse apartment in Manhattan, and his trips to luxurious destinations by private plane. The Fernie Festival Fund has been banned for life from serving as a corporate officer or director and agreed to the repayment of $27.4 million, which is to be deemed satisfied by the forfeiture order entered in the current sentencing in the, in the related criminal case. The Fallon pleaded guilty on two counts of wire fraud this past March and is scheduled to be sentenced on those charges in August. If found guilty, the Fire Festival founder face up to a decade in jail, which he probably won't get, really. If he's got good lawyers, he probably will get a lot of, maybe a suspended sentence or do some community service. But still, fucking hell. To recap what we already know, Fire Festival was organized by Ja Rule and Billy McFarland's Fire Media Company. It, why isn't Ja Rule being sued then? That's interesting, isn't it? He's been kept out of this. Maybe he's he has been kept he has been keeping his head down on social media. I haven't seen him saying too much, but maybe, you know. It developed an image of a luxury of luxury due to a significant social media campaign that cele that had celebrities posting Instagrams post on Instagram to, to off No. Why can't I read properly here? It develops an image of luxury due to a significant social media campaign that has celebrities post on Instagram to off the the, the festival's paradise of offerings. Tickets range from $4,000 to $12,000, and the lineup features major laser disclosure, Skepta, Ketchenada, and more. That said, artists pulled out before the festival began without knowledge to, to ticket holders. Once patrons arrived, they were met with an empty beach, horrible tent conditions, and bread and cheese for meals. A documentary series about the festival debacle will attempt to outline the fe entire festival and set to land on Hulu 2019. I can't wait to watch that. Fucking hell, man. <coughs> So it's interesting. So he's been fired. He's sorry. He's being he's being um he's being sued by investors who were duped into believing that this was a feasible idea, right? Which is annoying, isn't it? Because you've heard of a lot of people. There's a lot of stories of people finagling investment, right, in order to kind of get to the next step, right? Sort of like lying about figures, but also coming or but also showing and proving. That's part. That's the major key part of these things. If you're gonna lie, when you do when you do get a chance to show and prove, actually show and prove. But unfortunately, he's kind of fucked up the whole situation for people that want to finesse um, by lying about his figures and also not being able to deliver, which is fucking disappointing. But it's interesting to see that he, this is, but I'm, I'm assuming some, uh, some attendees must be suing him, right? Um, there must be some people that attended the thing who paid loads of money and didn't, because you would sue, wouldn't you? Or, is this like, or, 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 can, they, or can they cover themselves um, by saying that you know these things happen by i don't know wind and shit maybe the weather wasn't great during the festival i wonder 
but the festival can be liable. So if the festival didn't go on, but you know what this made me think of? It made me think of the whole TanaCon and FuseyTube thing. Like this whole um, YouTubers putting on events and the, them fucking up, right? Like disastrously. There is there is something about this age of social media and about clout and about exposure and about attention that some people have it skewed where they're not thinking long term, right? For, for instance, this this guy Billy McFarlane has kind of burned these bridges permanently, right? You fucked up. You fucked up. You fucked over yourself for, for life. Because you went into instant gratification of being a guy that made this fire festival, flying in private jets, having your hand on the side of a private PJ with your Hublot and your feet up with your Yeezys looking out of a window of a private jet, right? You wanted that whole like short term immediate gratification, right? Fucked over your investors, um, ruined your reputation for life, right? Everyone's going to know of you as the fire festival guy fucked up a few. You. Now you've been banned from being a, a businessman, which probably you were beforehand, and you're probably going to spend some time in prison, right? So you fucked yourself over. But a lot of people in social media land nowadays kind of want that notoriety anyway, right? They'd rather they'd rather be Tanner, right, and and do TanaCon absolutely flop, right? It'd be an absolute disaster show, than have no attention on you whatsoever. They just don't care. They just want eyes on them, regardless of what the eyes on them are are saying about them, which is really weird. But there is a weird little trend happening with putting on events that don't actually happen. I don't know what that is about. Um. I don't come from that school, man. I come from a school of uh, worrying that people are going to come to your birthday or not, but actually putting on the birthday party, right? I'm that idiot that puts on a birthday party. When I remember I was younger, like stringing, up, stringing balloons, putting up signs, cakes and shit, and then no one turning up, right? That's the, the, that's the place where I'm from. And I don't know, it's just worrying. I just find it worrying. Like you can put on an event and it not happen and it's be okay. Um, obviously it's not okay now in this case because you know he's been sued for 27.4 million mate 27.4 it's like shit i'm pretty sure he doesn't even have that money right so i'm not sure how they're gonna get it he maybe has to forfeit some assets or some shit um because if you're gonna if you're gonna raise that money for the fight i'm sure i'm sure he doesn't have that liquid cash on him it's, it's unlikely but god almighty man jesus christ um he had an absolute shit show i'm surprised no one else has come and filled that void though because as shitty as an idea it was as shit as execution it was, there is there is something to be said for that whole like um social media influencers, socialites putting on a festival that they all kind of endorse. I guess um Coachella is already that thing, right? But a, a, a kind of islandy, a more sort of like um holistic, a more sort uh, not holistic, a more so uh a more hippier version of Coachella, right? Like actual meditation camps and maybe uh, a time during a festival where everyone looks where their phones and that kind of, you know, a, a kind of counter, a kind of counter movement against all the other festivals out there where everyone's kind of posting their entire journey from packing to the road trip to actually arriving at the festival. There is a, I feel like there is a sort of movement heading towards that way and I'm, I'm surprised no one's kind of filled that niche yet. I thought that maybe that's where Fire Festival maybe kind of had its idea. Because, again, in all these tragedies, there is an opportunity to do something with it, right? For someone to say, okay, cool, I'm going to actually do something. So for all the Fuzi Tubes and Tanacon events that have been fucking garbage, there is also an avenue for a Shane Dawson to be like, you know what, actually, I'm going to put an actual... Good, uh, let me show you what a good festival is like, right? Let me actually put on an event, ha hire an actual events management firm, right? And organize this for real. Because, you know, I don't buy it. Like, it's not that hard to put on an event, but also don't put on, don't try and turn around in, in a couple of months or in a week or two. That doesn't make any sense either. Um, but yeah, who knows? But 27.4 million, man. Fucking hell. Imagine being sued for that much. Like, woo! Woo, indeed. Um, well, that's an hour of the Action of Zinger Show. What, well, episode number 90? I think that might be a good place to end it. <laughs> Um, this has been me, your host Agostino. It's been very much fun to speak to you guys again. Um, I'll be back again, I think, on... No, not I think. I'll be back again tomorrow with another chock full episode for you guys to partake in. I hope you've had fun. I hope you like listening to what I had to say and I've given you some wise words and also filled you with some comedic value. As always, I'll be DJing this Friday at Tap East for a night called Tapped tap east for a night called tapped this friday in westford stratford from the times of five to seven i'll get the flyer up again here on the screen so you guys can see there it is i'm djing this friday tapped 
at Tappy's Brewery. You can find me there spinning the best of soul, disco, funk, and R&B, and everything else in between. I can't wait. It should be a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fun. Outside of that, I'm also going to be DJing at Heathcote and Star on the 26th on a Sunday, Bank Holiday Sunday. So expect to hear some more details out, um, around that. I'm going to have some special guests there too that I can't wait to announce. And yeah, just, you know, just keep grinding. I'm grinding. I'm also reading this book. This is fucking amazing too. I'm going to hopefully finish it end of this week. I'm already a quarter of the way through, right? So I'm really happy about that. Reading two hours a day really does help, by the way. But anyway, this has been the Extreme Extreme Show episode number 90. We're finally out of the 80s. Hallelujah. We've done it. Congratulations. I can't wait to get out of the 90s. We're going to be into the hundreds very, very soon. This has been the Extreme Extreme Show episode number 90. Thank you for tuning in with me, your host, Agostino. And I'll see you again very soon. Peace.